basically you can take all this panting, smoldering wrath and, and see it in the Bible in three dimensions. The first dimension is this, and, and we'll get to this in the days ahead as we go through Revelation, but we can see God's eternal or ultimate wrath. That's eternal conscious punishment of sinners in hell. Now in Revelation 14, you see it first mentioned, the, the wrath of God that, that causes the, the sinners to go to the lake of fire. And then chapter 20 is the lake of fire in verse 15. But not only is there God's eternal or ultimate wrath, the Bible is filled with another type of wrath. And that is this period of time. It's called the day of the Lord. And it's the day of of God's coming future wrath when the dam bursts. Now, hell is not the dam bursting. It is the, the localizing of all the people who have ever refused to repent into one place where God directs his wrath forever and just puts that attribute of his, he just puts it right there, forever burning against their sin. But the day of the Lord is different. The day of the Lord is not hell. It's what we call the tribulation. It's God smiting the earth in the tribulation. And that's what so much of the Old Testament is about. So much of the Old Testament, in fact, if you read the book of Zephaniah, little three-chapter book, in the first chapter, it talks about, it's talking about the Babylonians and how they destroyed Jerusalem. And then Zephaniah says, but that's nothing compared to the great and gloomy and horrific day of the Lord. See, all the prophets were looking at this future time. And then, Lord willing, next Sunday, I hope, we'll be able to look at the constant warning of God's present wrath. You see, there are, for every sin that's ever committed by anyone, anywhere, saved or unsaved, there are consequences. Most of us are so unaware of that. I mean, we just, you know, yeah, a little lie here, a little lie there. Every time we sin, there is a consequence. There is a retributive consequence, which is a theological term for God has to make a retribution and, and judge that sin, but there's also in us a consequence. Every time you lie, you're a little less truthful. Every time you steal, you're a little less trustworthy. Every time that we get enraged, we're a little less under control. And every, there is a consequence. I mean, every time uh, someone abuses alcohol and becomes drunken, it's a destructive poison in their body. Same with other chemicals, same with everything, every, even immorality. The Bible says every time we commit immorality, there is a consequence in our body. So there is, there is God's present wrath, which shows up in the consequences of sin. And uh, we will, Lord willing, cover that. But let's just walk through and look at the, the usage of the words for wrath, starting in Revelation 6 and verse uh, 16. And what we see is in, in, the chronicling of God's wrath, we see him going between the thumas panting wrath to the horge smoldering deep held in wrath. And in verse 16, that's the orge. It says, uh, uh, he who sits on the throne from the wrath, that's the settled Uh, long building wrath of the Lamb. Then verse 17, it's the same word, the great day of his orge, his wrath has come. Now turn over to chapter 11 with me because I want you to see as this unfolds. The nations were angry and your wrath, horge, has come. This built up wrath. But, But look at what he says next in verse 18 of chapter 11. And the time of the dead, that is, they should be judged. So this is the retributive Wrath. God has built up this long, smoldering wrath, and, and he's going to bring retribution. But look what else it says. There's a positive note in chapter 11, verse 18. And you should reward your servants. Uh, this is in theology. Theology likes to put big words with everything, but this is called the remunerative. You've heard of remuneration, getting paid. Remunerative means that God rewards, look what it says in verse 18, you reward your servants, the prophets. Now, in God's justice, his retributive and remunerative justice, there is an exact accounting. God knows exactly who is the biggest sinner and who sinned the most. God also knows who's the greatest servant who has served him the most. And he remunerates and has retribution that is coincidental and and coincides with the amount. So that means, Jesus said, that that person who has sinned little will have few stripes. They will be punished less than one who has many sins. They'll have many stripes. So it does make a difference how bad you are in sin on earth and how much you serve the Lord. 
for eternal rewards. And we'll, we'll cover that when we get deeper into Revelation 2. But look at verse 19. Here's the, the first, um, I'm sorry, chapter 14 and verse 10. Uh, this is the first time both words are in one verse. And it says, he himself shall also drink uh, the wine of the wrath. Now, this is not the smoldering, settled, long-standing. This is the thumos, the panting wrath of God. It's poured out like a cup of wine which is poured out full strength into the cup of his, and here's the word, wrath, horge, translated indignation. It's because two words that meant so similar, they, they translated them, rendered them a little differently, but it's both words. Thumas is the first one, the wrath of God, which speaks of the, the, the explosive panting wrath, and the indignation is the horge, the settled wrath. Now look at verse 19. It's Thumas again, into the great wine press of the wrath of God. Keep going to chapter 15, verse one. Thumas again, the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath, Thumas, the panting of God is complete. Chapter 15, verse seven, against Thumas again, translated wrath, bowls full of the wrath or Thumas of God. Chapter 16, another occurrence of that, that panting, you know, visible wrath. Uh, it says in 16, one, the bowls of the wrath of God. And then in verse 19, they're both there. Now the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and the great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness, there's the panting, thumas, the, the thumas of his wrath, and that's the word horge. It's the settled, long, smoldering wrath. And then the last occurrence is in chapter 19. It's at the second coming. Now, this is what's so interesting to me in the doctrine of God. Here, here people all the time say, oh, the God of the Old Testament, he's killing all those Canaanites and all that bad stuff, and he's judging people, but Jesus, Jesus would never do that. And that's, that's kind of the, the liberal, social gospel, Albert Schweitzer-esque kind of, Jesus is so sweet, he wouldn't condemn anyone. But look, here's Jesus, chapter 19. He's actually riding a white horse at the front of all the hosts of heaven. The saints are there and all the, all the angels of heaven, the, the redeemed and righteous, or I mean the uh, uh, glorified angels that will never sin are behind him. But look at 19. Out of his mouth, Christ's mouth, goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. The first time the earth sees Jesus after the resurrection. We've seen him, uh, the disciples saw him, we see him in the church walking around in Revelation two and three and four and five, he's being worshiped. First time the earth sees him, humans, since his resurrection. And, and he's got this sword and he's striking them and then look what it says next. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. By the way, this is a little preview of the millennium. This is the fulfillment of all those verses in the Old Testament that Jesus is gonna literally sit on the throne of his father David and rule over the nations. And Psalm 2 says, with a rod of iron. A lot of the Old Testament is about that. This shows us he's coming down with this sword, putting down the rebellion so that he can sit on earth and rule. But look what it says next. This is gentle, calm Jesus. He himself, that's Christ, treads the winepress of the thumas, that's the panting wrath, and the horge, that's the smoldering wrath of Almighty God. Jesus embodies the Almighty God's panting, smoldering wrath. Well, God's eternal wrath is a constant theme in Christ's ministry. Uh, if, if you know, Jesus was introduced by John the Baptist, his cousin. And John the Baptist said this. This is what John the Baptist said. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? John the Baptist, introducing Jesus Christ, warned of this coming, smoldering, breaking out dam of God's mercy that has held it back, but letting out this wrath of God that culminates in hell. Now, after Jesus goes through the, the incredible evening visit of Nicodemus, and after he goes and shares with him about how you can be born again and how all sins can be forgiven and God didn't send his, send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might believe. Look how Jesus chooses to conclude that beautiful portrait. And he says this in verse 36. This is the, the record that Jesus chose to be the bookend to that great gospel presentation. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, 
But he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. But look what happens. The wrath of God abides on him. And that is the eternal, ultimate wrath. So that means anybody that's ever been born on this planet that does not repent and embrace Jesus Christ, the scriptures say the wrath of God will abide on them. Now this became, in Christ's ministry as he taught, a constant theme. Remember, Jesus talked more about this wrath than he did about the, the pleasures and the joys of heaven. And in Matthew 8, 12, Jesus is teaching along. He said, beware of the wrath that will cast anybody who rebels into outer darkness. That is not a positive thing to be into outer darkness. In fact, you say, how can you talk about a furnace and fire and outer darkness? Because Jude tells us that the eternal fire of hell is in the blackness of darkness forever. It's the absence of light. Kind of like, you know how astronomers and astrophysicists have found the black holes that absorb their, their power, gravitational power is so great they can absorb even light and it just sucks it in and it's blackness. That's an that's a astrophysical description of the blackness of darkness that Jesus talks about. In Matthew 13, 42, Jesus is in a string of parabolic teaching and he said, beware of fake followers of Christ. He says they're like, they're, they look like real wheat, but they're tares. They're, they're fake. They have no fruit. They have not been born again. And they will be cast into the burning furnace of God's wrath. Jesus is always alluding to this horrible end. He says the same wrath is on the wicked in verse 50. Here's one where he puts them together. In Matthew 18, Jesus says, take extreme measures about sin. Don't think of sin as, oh, that's nothing. I can worry about it later. It's not, you know, someday I'll think about that or I'll get right or I'll do enough good. He says, take an extreme measure now. And this is what he said. If your hand or foot causes you to sin. Now, how many sins can you think of with your foot? Come on. What he's saying is if any part of where you go, what you do, hands, feet, anything in your life is leading you to perpetuate sin and sinful behavior against a holy God, cut it off and cast it from you. What it means is get rid of that part of your life. Now, of course, the uh, masochistic, mutilating type of people think that he's advocating hand cutting, you know, like Islam does. No. What he's saying is take radical means sin is that bad to God. And, and then he says this, it's better for you to enter into life maimed. You're dying. When you die is when we enter into life. That means what we're experiencing right now is pale compared to what he offers. That Jesus is implying we're not even in real life right now. We're just existing. Life is coming. But look at this, it's better to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands or feet and to be cast into the everlasting fire. Look at verse nine, to be cast into hell fire. Jesus, two for one. This is very exemplary of what he taught like. Life, that's heaven, hell, hell. That's the wrath, two for one. It's a very very natural form or common formula with Jesus. Twice as much about judgment as about life. Well, real quickly, it's not just Christ, but this picks up in Paul's ministry. One of the most frequent usages outside of Revelation is Paul, in his epistle, he, he explains the wrath of God. And, and we don't have time to go through all these, but just the references on the screen. Romans 1.18, Lord willing, will be there next Week. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. There is an element of the present horrific results of sin in a culture. Did you know America right now is the most blatant, in your face, before all the world to see, propagator of godlessness? I mean, in, in every way. I mean, uh, we recently had an election, uh, you know, what, in 12, so last year. And one of the parties that was nationally being elected in their platform had made planks that are abominations against God. Homosexuality, abortion. We actually have people running on platforms of sin, running our country, a Christian nation. Amazing. God is against that. 
He has strong warnings. He says, my wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness and those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And you know, a little uh, New York Times went out and they were interviewing some of the upscale college kids, you know, you know how New York is ringed by some of the greatest schools in the nation. They were out interviewing him, so what do you think of abortion? One of them said, abortion? We should abort some of the kids that are alive. They aren't needed either. They're useless. I mean, college kids. They say, why just get them before they're born? Let's get them after. See, that's, that's the decline, the declension, the sinful spiral that sin undealt with goes into and only gets worse. And this is what the Lord says in Romans 2, 5. In accordance with your hardness, your impenitent heart, you, you resist God and you won't repent. You're treasuring up for yourself wrath. God doesn't respond. He doesn't burn up the, the uh, raping kidnappers on the spot. The guy that shot up the apartments in Miami or wherever it was last night and the... SWAT team took him out. God didn't burn him on the spot. He treasures up his wrath and waits. He's merciful. He's waiting for them to come to repentance. But if they don't, he's storing it up for the righteous judgment of God. Uh, in uh, Romans 2.8, both words show up. Those who are self-seeking and don't obey the truth but obey unrighteousness will face the indignation, that's the thumas, that's the panting wrath, and the horge, that's the settled wrath of God. Uh, when Paul shared the gospel in uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, just to skip ahead, he told people, if you get saved, you're saved from the wrath to come. The eternal, ultimate wrath. So God is by nature characterized by a perfect, holy, and just hatred against sin that leads him to store up his fury. God stores up his fury, and in his wrath is settled and focused against sin. Do you see why Jonathan Edwards 300 and some years ago, or yeah, 300, almost 300 years ago, preached sinners in the hands of what? Yeah, this panting, smoldering, wrath of God. No sin can go unpunished because God is absolutely holy and just. So even though there may be little or no evident response from God, for most of the sins being poured out by fallen and sinful humans, God's justice has kept track of every sin ever sinned against the infinite, all-knowing, holy God of the universe. He's got a record of every one of them. But a moment is coming when the river of humanity's sins piling up behind the dam of God's patience finally reaches the limit. And when that limit is reached and the dam is breached, the righteous, infinite, just wrath of Almighty God bursts forth. And that's Revelation 6, 17. That's the event when it happens, when the wrath of God for whom no one can stand, breaks out. <laughs> 